Everything, remember, has a dharma. Every creature, every rose, and every human being has a dharma. You're already fulfilling it physically. You're already in the bodies that you were intended to be in. Remember what I said before, it is not about where you are, it's about what direction you're headed. And as long as you know you're heading in the direction of staying here in meaning. Now, this concept of a calling, I mean, I wrote a whole book about it. It's called Inspiration, In Spirit. And the subtitle is called Your Ultimate Calling. So I'm going to introduce a word here to help you to identify your calling. And that word is passion. And it doesn't make any difference to me whether that passion has anything to do with making a living or uh, it's a part of the DOT, the Dictionary of Occupational Titles. What is it that you find passion about and the only condition I place on it is that it is in alignment with God or with your source. All right? So that your passion, if your passion is about killing other people, for example, if your passion is about stealing, if your passion is about, uh, I often said that there's two ways to have the tallest building in town. One of the ways to have the tallest building in town, always, is to go around and knock down anybody else's building when they start getting taller than yours. So as soon as they get up, if you're at the 44 floors and they get to 43, 44, you just go over and you put some explosives in there and you just blow it up. And you say, I, I have the tallest building in town. And this is, by the way, our collective ego. <laughs> this is what we do in our society and in our world, and which is about, if you really want to know my passion and my calling, it's about shifting the entire consciousness of this planet before I leave it. And that's why the film titled The Shift is so significant to me, because I know that if I can get 10 million people to watch that film, The Shift, if I can get 10 million people in America and Canada to watch that film, that we reach something called Pi, 3.1416, remember? <laughs> and if you can get 3.1416 percentage of a population to align, the rest of it's called a critical mass in physics. You reach what is called phase transition. And if you align enough people or electrons or subatomic particles up and align them in a certain way in an energy field, and you reach what they call the hundredth monkey, when you reach that point, all the rest of the electrons or the people in that energy field begin to align as well. And we have aligned ourselves collectively with a consciousness that uh, allows for people to knock down other people's buildings. The other way to have the tallest building in town is to always work on your own building and not be concerned with anybody else's building or what anyone else out there is doing or being consumed with trying to compete with or win or defend. To listen to your calling. So your calling is the thing within you that has your attention, that has your passionate attention. And it doesn't make any difference whether it makes sense to anybody else. It's the thing that you feel inside of you that you're here for. It's Mr. Holland in Mr. Holland's opus. And here's the secret. Here's the thing that I learned. That it's the presence of the passion. That when you have the presence of the passion within you for what it is that you feel is your calling, Everything else will take care of itself. That is an indication that you have God within you and guiding you. The word enthusiasm and theos, yasm, translates to the God within in Greek. The God within. When you are enthusiastic about something, anything, when you have that kind of internal knowing that this is what I'm doing. And sometimes you have to, uh, you know, that Shakespeare's 
he wasn't just a great writer, he was an incredible philosopher. Probably the most famous lines from Shakespeare are from Hamlet. To be or not to be, that is the question. And that's a very profound question. But what follows that is much more profound. He said, after to be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the minds of men to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and thus by opposing end them. You have to ask the question and that's what this program is about and that's what the movie is about and that's what the book is about and that's what all of it is about. To be or not to be? Am I going to be who I came into this world to be and there's something inside of me that has always been calling me to it? Or am I going to allow the slings and arrows of an outrageous fortune that has been imposed upon me by others to dictate my dharma? That's really the question. And it's a question that you can answer and respond to and live with and that allowing is a great substitute for doing and trusting and knowing that when you align yourself in the way that I'm asking you to align yourself here today as I speak to you about meaning when you align yourself this way and begin to trust in what Lao Tzu called your original nature and when you understand your original nature and you return to it. Basically, that's all you're ever doing, even with all of the medical practitioners that are out there. Basically, they're really trying to help you to return to your original nature, your nature of well-being. There's not a doctor on this planet that can heal anybody, and they will all tell you that, that the body is the hero. It is not any medicines or any surgeries or anything out there that is what's doing it. That healing is this most magical thing. It's like, it's like the wind, you know? It's just, you can't get a hold of it. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't grasp it. And all you can do is just watch the results. Watch the effects of it. You cut your hand and it bleeds and you just watch it. And all of a sudden, things start happening inside of your body and red blood cells head towards that direction and white blood cells start doing this and all kinds of things begin happening, not just there, but in your heart and in your lymph system and in your elimination system and in your neurological system. It all starts working together and it starts sending things to it and such a, a scab forms and then the scab dries up and then there's a scar and then things start... Nobody's done anything. What, what is there to do? It's part of the magic of allowing, of just getting out of the way and not trying to do too much interfering. Yeah, if there's something in there that you have to take out, you take it out gently, but uh, you don't fill yourself with chemicals and things that uh, the body is going to just have to process and have difficulty with as well. This is from uh, Abraham Heschel in a wonderful book called Man is Not Alone. I loved it. He said, life is not meaningful unless it is serving an end beyond itself, unless it is of value to someone else, that you'll never find meaning through your ego. Life is not meaningful unless it is serving an end beyond itself, unless it is of value to someone else. And secondly, this is from Albert Schweitzer, everyone's hero. The one possible way of giving meaning to your existence is that of raising your natural relation to the world to a spiritual one. In other words, you have to return to spirit if you're going to find meaning. This is from Emmanuel. Our mind doesn't know the way. Our heart has already been there. 
and our soul never left. Welcome home. Isn't that good? Our mind doesn't know the way, our heart has already been there, and our soul never left. And this is what I wrote. Having arrived home, each breath we take is an expression of our life's purpose. We no longer struggle to win, to gain the approval of others, to meet expectations others had for us, to acquire, to achieve, to hoard, or to fulfill someone else's idea of our dharma. We let go of conflict, certainty, being right, fighting, dominating, vanquishing, and feeling superior. All of this ego stuff loses its power and attraction when we arrive home where meaning and purpose welcome us. We are home. From our home is where we began. You got to know that that's our home. That was our beginning. Ambition all the way away from our home to take on a false self. A reverse and all of the signs of coming back, returning home. And now we're home. And this is where meaning begins to be the dominant force in your life. It begins to be the all. And those around you or in your life and those you encounter who would try to take you away from your meaning no longer even become obstacles to you. They become, in the Tao it says, a good man is a bad man's teacher. And a bad man is a good man's job. They become your job. They no longer become someone who annoys you and finds fault with you. If they do find fault with you, you're immune to it. As Maslow used to say, learn these two things and you're self-actualized. Become independent of the good opinion of other people and detach yourself from outcome. In other words, do what you do because it is your calling. Inspiration responds to our attentiveness in various and sometimes unexpected ways. For example, when I began writing this book, I debated between the two titles, Inspiration, Your Ultimate Destiny, or Inspiration, Your Ultimate Calling. One day, while I was swimming in the ocean, I was going back and forth in my mind, trying out both titles. Still uncertain, when I'd finished my swim, I called Reed Tracy, who's the president and CEO of my publishing company at Hay House, from a payphone to get his opinion about the title. While I waited for him to answer, the word calling appeared on the miniature screen of the telephone. Nothing else, just calling. And then the word began to flash on and off, as if it were trying to get my attention. When Reed answered, I told him what had just occurred, and we both agreed on inspiration, your ultimate calling for the title of this book and this program. All of this may appear to be nothing more than a silly coincidence, but I know better. I think of the word inspiration as meaning being in spirit. When we're in spirit, we're inspired. And when we're inspired, it's because we're back in spirit, fully awake to spirit within us. Being inspired is an experience of joy. We feel completely connected to our source and totally on purpose. Our creative juices flow and we bring exceptionally high energy to our daily life. We're not judging others or ourselves. We're uncritical and unbothered by behaviors or attitudes that, in uninspired moments, are frustrating. Our heart sings in appreciation for every breath, and we're tolerant, joyful, and loving. Being in spirit isn't necessarily restricted to the work we do or the activities of our daily life. We can be inspired and at the same time be unsure of what vocation to pursue or what activities we want to schedule. Inspiration is a simple recognition of spirit within ourselves. It's a return to that invisible, formless field from which all things emanate, a field of energy that I call intention in my previous book, The Power of Intention.
my experience with being in spirit. When I'm in spirit, I have a feeling of contentment, but more than this, I experience joy. I'm able to receive the vibrational energies of my source, call them voices or messages or silent reminders, even invisible suggestions or what have you, but they're vibrations of energy that I'm able to align with as I get myself out of the way. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, one of the world's great geniuses, once remarked, quote, When I am, as it were, completely myself, entirely alone and of good cheer, say, traveling in a carriage or walking after a good meal or during the night when I cannot sleep, it is on such occasions that my ideas flow best and most abundantly. Whence and how they come, I know not, nor can I foresee them. End of quote. We don't have to be a genius to know what Mozart speaks of. The same force in a different way is flowing through you and me right now. I've learned to remove resistance to the free flow of this spiritual energy by reminding myself to align with it or to be in spirit in my thoughts and my expectations. When I sit down to write, my desire is to invite spirit to express through me, and I encourage ideas to flow freely, like, like Mozart. I'm connected as if it were to my source in spirit, thinking and expecting to be the instrument of my spiritual source. Ideas flow, and whatever assistance I need just shows up. And, like Mozart, I can't describe how the ideas come, and I can't force them. Staying in spirit seems to be the secret to this feeling of being inspired. I also find that inspiration flows in other areas of my life when my primary mission is like what Michael Berg so beautifully describes in Becoming Like God, Kabbalah, and Our Ultimate Destiny. Quote, Just as every being is God's business, every being becomes our business as well. Unquote. That is, being inspired necessitates the willingness to suspend ego and enter a space where I want to share who I am and what I have in a completely unlimited fashion. When you feel inspired, everything works. The reason that everything works is because you have left the material, the physical world, the world of the ego, and you've moved into the world of spirit. And when you move into the world of spirit, into that invisible world, you get connected. And inspiration means inspired. And Patanjali said, when you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your mind transcends limitations. Your consciousness expands in every direction. And you find yourself in a new and great and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties, and talents come alive. And you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. There's some very important wisdom in that. This idea of finding yourself inspired means that you allow these dormant forces, these things that are in every single one of us, to come alive. Consciousness begins to expand. Things begin to show up in your life. You begin to manage the coincidences of your life. 